He's authored over 150 papers, several books, um, and I'm going to stop here because it was a pretty long bio, so I had to cut it down. Um, but I'd like to leave you a little time to talk. So Dolores Gallagher Thompson. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ken. That's a lovely introduction, and I'm really delighted to be here. I was so pleased when Ken invited me to participate uh, because I know that this is the other half of the equation, you might say, from what we were hearing a lot about this morning, which is focusing more on the individual with the cognitive impairments. Now we want to see how we can sort of contextualize that better within the family environment and it really include the family members in this whole process. How to, how to do that? I'm, I'm not going to have the answers, but I'll hopefully raise some ideas for you. So this is probably data you already have seen seen or are familiar with from other sources, but uh, it shows you that younger than, than 85, the prevalence is not as great. Once we reach the age of 85, the prevalence increases substantially to one in three. And this graph is just another way of, of looking at that. So the largest piece of the pie is individuals over the age of 85. Um, they are also the fastest growing segment of the long-term care field. Uh, so I think this, uh, this particular figure depicts that. We see the rate of growth going from about 5% to about 14% within a relatively short period of time. So what this means, uh, what the implications I think are, is that we have people living longer who are most likely going to have multiple medical problems, which is very common, and may also have some psychological issues as well, uh, depression, anxiety, PTSD revisited, or, and or may have cognitive impairments. So we're looking at a complex uh, array of, of issues, typically. Uh, we also have a gender effect. Um, Alzheimer's disease is more prevalent in women than it is in men. This is true at all ages. The women are in the gold bar. And you can see that at, again, past age 85, this is a substantial difference. So we're going to have many women with dementia of various kinds who need care. And part of that care traditionally has come from the family. So how is the family going to do that, especially if they have two parents? And perhaps there are other relatives as well uh, that need care. So technology is very important in terms of providing a way, <clears throat> helping caregivers provide some additional mechanisms for them to give the support and care that they want to give. Now in the U.S. and of course in many other countries in the world, we also have uh, concern and attention to issues of diversity. And in the U.S., <clears throat> the fastest growing population uh, in terms of diversity in uh, the general population as well as the over 65 is among Latinos. So Latinos have the fastest growth rate. And that term, Latino, covers a number of cultures and people from a number of different countries. So it is not, uh, doesn't just mean, oh, Spanish speaking. Oh, yeah, okay, that's Latino. No, because Latinos can come from, from Mexico, from Puerto Rico, South and Central America, uh, and other countries as well. So what we find <clears throat> is not only is it the fastest growing group, but it's a group with the higher likelihood of having developed Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. Uh, even though the diagnosis is often missed and the individual doesn't come into the system until they're pretty late in the process. So the number of Latinos living with Alzheimer's will about triple within a pretty short period of time. We're looking at 2030. So I mention that uh, because First of all, that may be a potential market for testing some of the products that we've heard about today. And in, if that were the case, then taking cultural issues into account would be extremely important in getting the cooperation of the family and the rest of the network. But this last point I want to emphasize as well, because the risk in Latinos is eight times greater with diabetes and stroke together. It's lower than that if it's just one or the other. But these are modifiable risk factors, potentially modifiable risk factors. One could have better control of one's diabetes, for example, uh, than is often the case, particularly in minority elders, particularly in older minority elders. So 
this is something that I think technology could be of great help with, is helping the individuals continue to monitor and do well on their, in their health so that they can potentially uh, reduce their risk for Alzheimer's. But there are other reasons why Latinos are at high risk for developing some form of dementia. And one is perhaps an obvious one, but life expectancy is increasing to the age of 87. That's the estimate, which is pr uh, much longer than the uh, traditional life expectancy for Latinos. They also have the lowest education level of any of the minority groups in, in uh, California. More than half have eight years or less of formal education. So this means that any technology products need to be developed in a manner that promotes their use by, in, if we're looking at this particular group, promotes their use by individuals who may not be able to uh, read and write as well as other groups might. I mentioned the d diabetes, hypertension, and another issue it, with Latinos, again, it, using this as an example of um, di how diversity plays into this whole picture, Latinos do not utilize healthcare services as much as virtually any other minority group in the state of California, and nowhere near the rate of Caucasians. So if they, if they have these problems, which we're saying are um, it, quite significant and c will continue to grow, and they have poor access or, and or underutilize the health services that exist, this is another way in which technology can be very important because that can bringing something into the home uh, that people can be trained to use effectively may actually uh, help this particular problem because some of the health care could be delivered that way. At least that's what I think. Um, so when we use the term caregiver or carer, which is the more common term outside of the United States, what do we really mean by that term? Okay, well, generally speaking, we're referring to a family member who provides assistance, more than the ordinary assistance that you would provide to an older family member. So they provide assistance with paying bills, supervising medications, um, getting people to appointments, helping them keep their schedule straight, that type of thing. Those are called instrumental activities of daily living or more personal things such as bathing, dressing, grooming, eating, which are much more demanding on the individual, the caregiver. They are considered, most caregivers are informal. In other words, they're not paid for providing this care. The uh, economic estimate of what this care would cost if the government or someone were paying for it is in the billions. So it is unpaid help. Now, granted, there is a growing proportion of caregivers who are paid and formally trained, and they are caregivers in settings like assisted living and nursing homes and home health. So there is that portion as well. But generally speaking, when we talk about it, we're referring to the informal or family member. The majority are women. Uh, this is true globally in virtually every study that's been done in every country, including the United States. Um, men are infrequently the primary caregiver. The estimates vary from somewhere between 10 and 20 percent, depending on how you define caregiver. Um, but many men often have important roles in the family. They are decision makers. They provide guidance to the family. This varies a great deal from culture to culture, so we have to look at developing programs that are going to be user-friendly for both men and women, though women are, is going to be the greater share of the market. Um, and many caregivers are proud of their role, and they're very happy to continue doing caregiving, at least for a while. But there seems to reach a point, and again, it doesn't matter what country you study, it seems to come a point where there's something similar to what we would call burnout on the job, where the person just can't do it anymore, or they can't do it all anymore. They need assistance, and that's the, the time when um, the things we've been talking about today would be very appropriate to introduce, if not sooner. So who are they? Most are between the ages of 40 and 60, spouses, 
wives typically or adult children and again typically daughter or daughter-in-law. Most have children at home under the age of 18. Um, the average duration, uh, it's said to be 4.5 years from 2010 data, but it's actually gotten a lot longer <laughs> because the uh, diagnosis is often done earlier with some groups, particularly Caucasians, and therefore the caregiving career is a longer career. And some individuals, for some people, it's, getting, it's creeping up to somewhere around 20 years. So it's like a whole nother career. So what do they do? I mentioned the instrumental and the activities of daily living. If you just look quickly at these lists, you may see that some are perhaps more desirable than others. Some you might find yourself very willing to do, and others you might say, I don't want to do those, or I can't. I don't have the time, I don't have the ability, I don't have the inclination. Um, other ways in which caregivers get into the picture, other things that they do, they modify the homes. Uh, they add assistive devices. Sometimes they uh, help with community integration or socialization as a person becomes more advanced in their cognitive impairment. Oftentimes they are socially inappropriate, and yet it, everyone needs social contact. We're social animals, so how to keep that available to the person with more advanced cognitive impairment is another role that caregivers play. But probably the one that brings them most often to the attention of the healthcare system is this one, that uh, the individuals, as they become more impaired, show more and more problem behavior, quote, or troublesome behavior. Things like wandering uh, in the middle of the night, getting lost, needing the police to be called for the person to be brought home, uh, is a very difficult thing for a family to have to deal with, especially if it's repetitive and it usually is once it starts. So until something is done to modify either the antecedent, what precedes the behavior, or something is done to change the behavior itself, it's gonna to continue to be extremely stressful. And that's just one example of a difficult behavior. Um, oftentimes another one that's pretty common that caregivers report is um, going to a restaurant with someone who's more cognitively impaired and they can no longer use the utensils appropriately and so they become an embarrassment to the family in that setting or going to church and the person can't follow along anymore with their with the service and so they start speaking or singing at the wrong time or something like that these are difficult things for families um, and I think we haven't even begun to explore how technology can help in some of these areas. But um, so the, the uh, many, about a third of employed caregivers say that they reduce their work hours or they're less effective at work. About half of them have made financial sacrifices. There's reduced time that the caregiver, the family, can spend in leisure, in vacations, hobbies, things like that, exercise, and their own health care. So what are some of the health, there are also health risks associated with caregiving. There are multiple studies, and again, it's global, it is a global phenomenon, that uh, reveal that there are physical health impacts from dementia caregiving, uh, in particular dementia caregiving, and they're not good. You know, it's dysregulated cortisol. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the person has uh, difficulty sleeping often, they have a dysregulated circadian rhythm. That's maybe a way to think about it. And we're talking about the caregivers now. We're not talking about the person with cognitive impairment. Um, they may use more psychotropic drugs for themselves uh, to be able to manage their anxiety, their stress, their depression. Uh, increased feelings of guilt and loss, feelings of pessimism towards the future are commonly reported by caregivers. And finally, uh, oftentimes this whole, whoops, I'm sorry, the whole idea of the health maintenance their own health maintenance kind of goes down the drain. So they forget about what their medications are. They forget about when they're supposed to go for their annual checkup or mammogram or, or preventive, other kinds of preventive health care. Uh, dental work often suffers until people are, you know, finally something happens and it's brought to their attention. So conceptually, for, uh, for some time in the field, the stress process model has been used to understand caregiver stress and to understand why some family members experience so much more stress and burden than others. 
Some, it seems like they're, you know, it's, they can deal with it and they deal with it till the very end and uh, they seem to need very little external support. Uh, that is not generally true, but there are some people like that. So you have to look at a combination of primary stressors, what it is that they're actually dealing with in their environment, which may be not only the person, one person with cognitive impairment, but several people, uh, depending upon, again, cultural influences come into play here very strongly. What symptoms, how difficult or easy that person is to live with or to manage, then there's the secondary stressors, the role strain that comes from having multiple roles. Um, caregivers have often been referred to as the sandwich generation. They're kind of in the middle between the parents and their own children and spouses. And then um, one thing that's, that's, I think, important about this model is that the stressors in themselves do not explain why some people develop significant depression, why others become so poor at managing their own health that they're hospitalized. It doesn't explain that. So what's the, this part, I think, though, does, which is the buffering resources that are available to the person. And the ones that have been identified in the literature include things like the, the adequacy of the support network, the coping styles of the person, whether or not they have spiritual resources available to them, those kinds of things. And now we're adding technology into the, into the model. Um, that has not been in this model before because people in, the, in this world that I'm representing, the caregiving world, uh, don't think in terms of how technology could be helpful. Um, it's a very recent, uh, very recent development. So what have we been doing to assist caregivers? Well, the early programs, the last 20 years, have been pretty psychologically based. Um, there are psychosocial programs uh, that are based on skill training, cognitive behavior therapy. There's support groups available in the community. The Alzheimer's Association is a very prominent leader in the field in providing uh, support groups, uh, again, across various cultures and in many languages in this region. Uh, and in general, they have good results. The psychoeducational programs are considered evidence-based by the federal government, and so they are much, they're more widespread than some of the other programs. Uh, promising programs, there's an internet-based program in Canada uh, done by Marziala and Garcia, which was one of the first, publication was in 2011, one of the first internet-based. So when we're talking about technology and caregiving, for the most part, we're talking about internet-based programs because that's about where the field is right now. So uh, this one got positive results. Um, one is in progress in the Netherlands that is also based on similar psychoeducational principles, um, eight sessions. So these are kind of long. Telehealth, this is very few studies on telehealth, which was basically helpline services available, few controlled studies, uh, helpline services available, uh, but the one that has been done with caregivers that was a randomized trial found benefit. Other programs have used video phones to en encourage people to be in a support group. So instead of a face-to-face -face support group, it's a video phone or a telephone-based support group. Uh, psychoeducation can be delivered in video form. Social media, and we've heard about some of the assistive technologies this morning, but um, we've heard about more advanced than what I'm talking about here. Uh, but these have been slow to be adopted in the caregiving community. So although, although some exist already, they have been slow. Uh, GPS technology, the trackers, um, very rarely used. Wireless home monitoring, that's getting to be more common because more and more people have alarm systems and things like that in their homes. Health tracking tools are becoming more common because of the use of the smartphones, but they haven't been necessarily applied to this situation. You all know about Lively, right? So I probably don't have to talk too much about this one, but uh, this company is one that seems promising for caregivers and uh, one that has been interested in exploring this further. But I want to also talk in the time that I have about some of the programs that we've done here. And um, 
focus a little bit on the coping with caregiving program. So, uh, and again, all of you can be thinking about how to modify this for the for the apps and for whatever else you might have in mind. Uh, but. Uh, this program is a psychoeducational program. Uh, I've completed four randomized trials um, where we compared the program to other things commonly in use, such as the support groups or telephone support. And those who received this particular program had greater improvement in their depression and life satisfaction. Um, historically, uh, many have been Latino caregivers uh, because that's been a particular personal interest of mine. Uh, and we have modified, through, the, through working with Latino caregivers, we've learned how to modify this particular program to make it more culturally relevant. Um, so now the program is in several translations. So you have the English, you have the Spanish. It's also in Chinese, modified culturally. It's also in Japanese, and it's also in Farsi. And I must say I've enjoyed running many of these groups myself, even though I don't speak all these languages, but you know, so I've been able to be like a co-leader along with someone who does represent the language and the culture, and uh, they are very effective, uh, partly because they teach people skills, and I'll, I'll go into it a little bit more after you see this clip. So the clip you're gonna see now is taken from our Chinese, uh, Chinese Mandarin-speaking Chinese uh, DVD program. So just a short clip to give you an idea. Whoops, no, that didn't work. Okay. Um, they told me all I had to do was this. There we go. Got it. Uh, sound. Sound. Up, can we increase the volume? You get, you can read it. You're reading the sub, you can read the subtitles, so even though you can't hear what they're saying. Okay, so what? You can read it. Don't know why we don't have the sound, but this is good. Right, definitely causes lots of trouble around here when you cancel too many times. <laughs> they can see um, because of the. It, ah, there you go. It's just, So now they redo it, so they're redoing it in a little bit gentler manner. might actually be more effective in the silence. <laughs> We're just about done with this one. Yeah, I'm not sure what would be happening here. There. Okay. That's okay. This one's done, but for the second one, that would be nice because it doesn't have subtitles. <laughs> so, okay, so, so this one, you see an example of um, the daughter getting very upset because the mother doesn't want to go to the doctor's appointment, which is, you know, 
understandable, especially if the daughter is in a hurry, right? She may be going to work, getting ready for work, or getting ready to take the kids, get, you know, get the kids to school or something like that. So uh, <clears throat> it's understandable that the mother, that the daughter, who is the primary caregiver, whoops. Nope, we don't want to rerun it. No, I don't want to rerun it, please. Thank so you. you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. Okay. So this, this particular DVD was filmed by professional actors who were able, I thought, to, to do a pretty good job. I, think they, I thought the woman with dementia was pretty convincing, even though she was, she had never heard of the word dementia before the time she got into this part. Uh, so, but that's uh, you know an example. I think one of the early examples of trying to use technology to help caregivers. So by looking at a not so desirable way of handling the behavior, and then looking at a more effective way uh, of handling the behavior, uh, they learn these skills. So what are the skills that we're? Oops. What are the skills that we're trying to teach them? There's a variety. The behavioral management tops the list. Then we have cognitive reappraisal. That means learning to think differently about your situation. Instead of being so uh, you know, pessimistic about it, perhaps there are some positive features that one could imagine and focus on. Communication is always an issue uh, because generally speaking, people with cognitive impairment don't communicate their thoughts and feelings very well to others. So teaching the caregiver how to communicate better with, that, with their loved one can be very helpful. Increasing positive activities, so caregivers to take better care of themselves is the idea here. We also have um, a way of increasing shared positive activities. And then finally, planning for the future. So I'll just go quickly through this. The program was used in uh, one particular program was called REACH One that some of you may be familiar with. A uh, program similar to what I showed you and what I described, one year follow-up showed a maintenance of gains. Then the second one is the REACH-2, which is the one that's probably more well-known. That was the largest caregiver study done in the United States with div and included diverse caregivers, around 650 common, uh, divided among African-American, Latino, and Caucasian. <clears throat> Five sites nationally, including Palo Alto, it's an expensive program, though, nine home visits, plus a phone-based support group uh, given over six months. And some features of the coping with caregiving were incorporated. Uh, one phone call was the control, so the control was obviously very minimal. And we found significant improvement, as you might expect, in the active versus the control condition. But what was very important and what's been since uh, borne out in other studies is that Latinos made the greatest improvement. And uh, the theory there is that that's because so few services have been offered to this group, uh, and the group is in general ready for intervention. So they are very active participants and very appreciative. Now, I Care Family, uh, this is a program, this is another internet based program that I was um, instrumental in developing, along with a technology company in the area called PhotoZig. So this is one of the first um, done in the United States, internet-based programs. Um, and now I would like to have some sound, because this one has no subtitles, OK? Welcome oh, to here the we go. Care it's just video not loud enough. For caregivers of individuals <laughs> with so I'm telling you the overview of the program. So this is me. Um, 20 pounds heavier, or 30, 30, 30 pounds heavier, actually. <laughs> Doesn't even look like that. Um, anyway, I, I just wanted to go through the overview of the program because each of, it's very short, each of the videos that's embedded in the program is longer. The videos are about 10 minutes long. <clears throat> um, that's what we're seeing. This was taken from another player. Okay. So this is an over, yeah. Um, so just wait to play until I give you the cue from the back. Okay. I honestly didn't touch anything the last time <laughs> by itself. Yes? Okay. There we go.
Welcome to the Eye Care Family Video Training for caregivers of individuals with memory problems. This video series focuses on teaching skills to you, the caregiver, to help you deal more effectively with stressful situations that you encounter in your everyday life when taking care of your loved one. Individuals with memory problems may suffer from Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia, or they may have dementia from another cause. Irregardless of the cause, there are certain memory and behavior problems that are typical and that result from dementia. For example, the person may act in different and unpredictable ways, not like their normal self. They may become depressed or anxious as they realize the changes that are happening to them. They may even become aggressive at times. It is very common for people with dementia and memory problems to repeat things, repeat questions, because they really don't remember the answers that have been provided to them. They frequently misinterpret what they see or hear, and they're often not able to take care of themselves very well in their everyday lives. For example, they don't remember when to take their medications, or they may have difficulty preparing meals, keeping appointments, driving themselves, and so forth. Caring for a person with dementia is a very difficult task, and it can be overwhelming at times due to the changes that occur in the individual as the disease progresses. They tend to become more impaired cognitively, develop more problems with behavior, and progressive mental decline occurs. The Eye Care Family Program is developed for caregivers of individuals like I've been describing. Our project staff, expert collaborators, and caregiver volunteers will walk you through our skill building strategies for managing more effectively the stress related to caregiving. Now you might be asking, what do we do exactly? Well, we provide you with examples of difficult behaviors that you may encounter Besides that, we give you practical tips and techniques which were developed in our research studies. We will also show you short video examples of caregiver and care receivers interacting. These will illustrate the concepts that we're trying to teach you and hopefully clarify in your own mind how to apply these strategies in your everyday life. And again, this is the, the state of technology and the application of technology to caregiving at present consists of a lot of programs like this. This was just one of the first in, in the United States. Um, it was, we had 150 caregivers in this particular randomized trial. Uh, it was only open to those who could read and understand English. So it is not available yet in any other language. Um, what did we do? We did the DVD training. Um, we saw just that short example. And we also had a workbook. And how did we do it? We had the filming. We used that as a way of trying to, trying to contrast the less effective with more effective ways of handling situations. And eye care actually got excellent results. So I explained to you a moment ago the reach program, which consisted of nine home visits and telephone calls over six months, which is probably necessary for some caregivers, but certainly not for all. And so this program, which uh, people completed within a three-month period, it's still a long program, so it generally took three months to go through all the videos and all the skill training exercises that we had online, but it got comparable results to what was found in the face-to-face -face studies. So I think that is um, noteworthy. And in fact, a recent literature review done by a fellow in the uh, Gero Psychiatry Fellow found that there are now 28 online intervention programs. This is a huge expansion just in the last couple of years, and they are in several languages. So besides the one I showed you, there's others in Spanish, Chinese, French, and Dutch. So this is clearly a, a a wave of the future. I think more, more and more research groups, as they get their findings from their research, want to apply them and want to turn them into practical tools. So 
Uh, however, we need to think much more broadly than what we've been doing so far. So what are some things that are interesting, some things that, that uh, are, as uh, Geriatric Education Center staff uh, located, the health bot, the robot assistant uh, in New Zealand, which apparently can actually do simple things for people. I, I don't know, I haven't seen it, I've just seen the, you know, looked at it on the website. Uh, and, and things we've been talking about, medication reminders, monitor daily movements, but it's also providing some entertainment and companionship. And this is my favorite, I think, so far, the giraffe, um, which is being, which is, being tested, I mean, it exists in Sweden, it's being used in Sweden, so it's a motorized robot um, that you can have a two-way video call with someone. Uh, it remains in the person's home. You see the, the example of it there, okay? So that must be the daughter, you know, talking to the mother. And the carer or the relative has the controls, so they can navigate, they can initiate the call, they can navigate the robot through the home and check up on the person and so forth. It does have the privacy concerns you, we heard about earlier, but for some people that may be really good. And of course, I love the robotic baby seal. Um, that is really promotes uh, feelings of, um, calmness and relaxation, it really works well with, the, with persons who are significantly cognitively impaired and agitated. I think it works for us too, probably, after a stressed day, you know. But it definitely works for them. There's a couple of nursing homes that I'm aware of that have introduced uh, Paro and have had excellent results with it. So, so more along those lines. So here are some of my ideas, what I think technology, what to do next, what I'd like to see. I'd like to see emotional support because in all the programs that have been successful that I've talked about, that's a, a cornerstone of the program is providing emotional support to the caregiver and hopefully also to the family member. Uh, but programs that are just technology and don't provide some emotional support, I don't think are gonna be adopted or, or not heavily used. Um, perhaps musical tones, perhaps prompts to exercise, perhaps some actual uh, talking through of exercises, gentle exercises, yoga, tai chi, various things that would have to be individualized for the person. Um, more direct assistance, you know, maybe actually helping someone put on their clothes. Again, as, the, as dementia advances more, people look at the clothes and they don't know what to do with them. They don't know they're supposed to put them on or they don't know where to put them. So the, you know, the shoes go on the hand, uh, the, the, the shirt goes somewhere else, you know. I mean, they don't put the clothes in the right place, places. So maybe some of these assistive devices could actually help dress a person. I don't know, but that would certainly save a lot of stress on the family because this is one of the tussles that family members get into with their loved one. Um, so um, I think the possibilities are endless, you know. I think it, we're just at the beginning of, of, the, of this partnership and um, look forward to where it's going to go next. Um, please feel free to contact me if you have questions about my presentation or want any follow-up. And I've given you the, the website for the Stanford Geriatric Education Center. If, particularly if you're interested in the diversity issues, we have a number of webinars, archived webinars on ethnicity and dementia that are free, uh, available to you. They run about an hour each. They're geared to a professional audience um, and they focus on ethnicity issues in dementia. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.